Hi, and welcome to another edition of On the Town. I'm Don Mackey. My guest today, Tim Allen, is the new principal of Birchland Park Middle School. You came in to a school system. That Kathleen Hill had been principal for, honestly, I don't remember how many years, but a long time. Um, where's that energy come from, and uh, how's it worked out so far for the first half of the year? Are you, are you tired? Are you still energized, or what? Yeah, no, I would say I'm still energized. Good. Um, I've been obviously really blessed. Birchland is an amazing place to be. Um, incredible student body. Um, you talked about Mrs. Hill. She really put together an incredible group of teachers and support staff. Um, so I would say the, only, the energy's only gone up um, as, you know, I'm inspired on a daily basis. Uh, I certainly believe in being energetic, you know. Um, working with young adolescents, they have a lot of energy, and their, their energy goes in a lot of different directions. So I think you'll find that a lot of the educators in middle schools um, are running around and being creative and thinking on, the, on their toes. And uh, so, you know, it's fit me well being in the middle schools uh, where energy really is helpful. And you came from middle schools in Springfield. Um, some people think middle school is like the hardest age, the most difficult. You've got a, you've got a broad range of, of kids who are really, you know, at the, at the, at, in the fifth grade end of, of sixth grade and then eighth graders who are probably halfway through high school already. I mean, how do you manage that and what, what do you see as the, the role of that of that middle school transition. Um, looking ahead to the future in terms of the way education is changing. Yeah. Well, the young adolescent is a really specific individual, you could say. Um, you know, besides infancy, it's the most uh, emotional and physical change a, a human being goes through is right at the time that they're in middle school. Uh, that's why the middle school model was created, because we really needed a different kind of education for that time period. Of course, academics is still the core, but we need to support kids in a lot of ways as they go through physical, emotional uh, changes. So I think middle school is um, just about the most important time uh, in many ways of the entire continuum of K through 12. Um, it's certainly, and a lot of high school administrators or, or educators will tell you, you know, when they get to ninth and 10th grade, they're, they're kind of in a routine. They're kind of, I don't want to say in a track, but they're in a mode. And, you know, um, we really need to grip kids in the middle school years and help them see how fun education can be, how meaningful it is, and how important it is. And if you can do that at the middle school, you have a lot of momentum going into the high school, and that carries through to college and beyond. Um, so with all that's happening to the young adolescent as a person, and then you add in the component of trying to educate them with all of our new standards and right. expectations, um, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot going on on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Um, but, you know, Birchland's been an amazing place to see all this happening, and like I said, the support staff and the teachers are, are, are just phenomenal, and the kids are great. So, you know, we're all navigating all of this together, and right. uh, as the leader of the building, you know, I, I, that's, that's what we try to put out there, myself and Mr. Martin, the assistant principals. We're all in this together. We're all here to improve the lives of our students, and... Uh, Let's stay, let's stay energetic and positive as we do so. So we, you started teaching out of, out of school in Dorchester. Um, now, have you been at the middle school level? Sort of, I mean, are you, were you drawn to that? Is that something that you intended to do? Or? Yeah, I didn't. So when I taught in Dorchester, I taught for two years at a juvenile detention center. So I was teaching kids from ages 13 to 20. Um, so that was a right out of college job, it was a great first experience. I really developed Boy, a lot of teaching strategies and just a, a sense of self that you need as an educator. Um, I was able to find in that position. Um, from there I went to Columbia for a year for a master's program and then I taught third grade um, in New York, in the Bronx. And uh, you know, everybody says it takes a special person to do middle school, but I, I say it takes a special person to do elementary. Um, so. Uh, I did that for one year. I gave it my best shot, but it wasn't for me. Um, and from there is when I came back home and, and moved up to the middle schools. And once I landed in a middle school, I definitely found that it was a really good fit for my style and my belief system and, and just what, what I want to accomplish with students. Um, I, I, I feel that t supporting them emotionally, um, that's a big component of the middle school model. So I think I have definitely found a home with the young adolescent students. So, so talk about that because supporting them emotionally, 
why is that you know, one of the things that you personally feel like it's something that you have the skill and the ability to, to bring to this and accomplish? Mm -hmm. and, and how is that, how is that maybe different from, from your own experience or did your own experience in middle school or in the prior schools that you've been in, does that, I mean, describe what that is for people. Yeah, well, for, for me personally, um, no matter what position I've been in, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really always focused on relationships. And so um, whether I'm leading a classroom as a teacher, whether I was an assistant principal leading sort of a grade of staff members and students, or as a principal trying to lead a whole building, um, to me, my style is relational. I want to have individual relationships with the people that work for me so I know how to best motivate them, how to best inspire them, how to best support them. Um, same thing with students. So, uh, you know, as a leader, you sort of have a style that's the core, for me, it being relationships. Um, and I think that's important at the middle school level. The middle school model with teaming and having a lot of sort of wraparound services for mm -hmm. students that are at the core um, that's based on relationships. That's based on we need to have structures in place that help us get to know our students individually because the only way we can help them navigate this challenging time period in their life is to really know them as individuals. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen at elementary and high school as well. It certainly does. But again, at this time of such change, um, it's really essential. So I think that definitely had something to do with me being happy when I landed in the middle school world. Um, and I've been here, you know, I think over 10 years now, um, is, is, is just that relational side and how important it is. And, and also it's important to supporting the staff members because right. as the students go through d changes on a daily basis, well, the <laughs> staff members, the teachers that are with them minute to minute, you know, they have to sort of surf these waves. Uh, and so my relationships with staff members hopefully help them feel supported, help them keep coming back, uh, help, help them see the good in each kid. Uh, so that's why I think it's become home for and me. And so, so where do those skills that you have to, to do that effectively? Because you, you wouldn't be putting yourself in a position to do it if you, if you didn't feel like you had those skills. Where do, they, where do those come from? I mean, where's that? Um, well, I hope, I hope I'm able to do it at least semi-effectively for sure. Um, you know, I, I think growing up, I, I think growing up, I was always sort of a, you know, a relationships kid. And, and, and I think it, um, it grew um, as I got older. Um, certainly, you know, basketball was pretty much my life growing up. Um, yeah. And um, so when I was a point guard, so you become kind of the de facto leader on the floor, the coach on the floor. So played on a lot of different travel teams and all, you know, in college and all that. And so that certainly developed my leadership voice, you know, and I think that um, the basketball court for me was a microcosm of the world. And, you know, you, you have to um, lead in a way that uh, people want to follow you, people want to work with you, um, and people feel inspired. So certainly that, but then also just my family upbringing, you know, I was blessed to live uh, in being a uh, have two parents that really were close, both big, big parts of my life, um, uh, a sister the same way, and, and, uh, and then just friendships along the way, you know. Um, all of that sort of played in. I've had a lot of long-term friendships. Now I've returned home, and they're still in place. And so I think all of that sort of lent itself to me being who I hope to be today and in the future. And I guess one of the things that when you get to be my age, that you learn about what you've learned and the value of, of, of any kind of knowledge. I mean, knowledge itself, you, you come to the, I, at least I've come to the point, to recognize, um, you know, physics is relational, mathematics is relational, language is, I mean, it's, it's probably the most fundamental kind of, I mean, grammar <laughs> is, is it's a construct of relations and and that all of that really points ultimately not to the knowledge itself or its practicality but that it becomes a window into the the kind of relations that develop between people mm -hmm. and and our shared experience and our and ways of talking about our shared experience and sharing the process of discovery mm -hmm. and imparting that to kids is uh, that's what i find enjoyable mm -hmm. um and so it's really cool to hear you talk about that as, as being sort of the big chunk 
of, of what you see your role as. Because I think, again, we, you know, and we'll get into this discussion about standards and expectations and assessments and all of that. And I think the real bottom line of why do we, why do we learn, why do we go to school together, yeah. <laughs> kind of gets left out of that conversation. But it is a very instrumental part of, mm -hmm. of what we're doing. So. Um, and to, to just add sure, to that yeah. point, um, <laughs> a couple years ago, I took a tour of Google, the main campus. I had a relative working there, so I was able to get a tour. And, uh, you know, Google is pretty much the epicenter of where the business world is going and the uh, technology world. And um, it, it, it was so interesting because they've done so many things, even with the layout of the, the Google campus, that just forces collaboration, forces the building of relationships. Um, you know, they have a cafeteria, which it's unbelievable. They serve a million different kinds of food. They make it so you don't want to go out to lunch. You want to eat there. Um, but then, you know, you can get a lobster or you can get sushi, but then you sit at a long cafeteria table. And the point of that is you can't just go sit by yourself and right. keep working. Now that you're at lunch, you have to sit with people and you probably are going to saddle up next to some, saddle next to people that you don't know because it's a long table. It's not a table for four. Um, they have kitchens every 80 or 90 feet in the office area so that people have to sort of congregate at a kitchen, sort of force the, uh, the water cooler conversations that, you know, were once, um, were once happening no matter, no matter, you didn't have to force them. Um, so yeah, so I, I do, I, it's my style, but I also think that it, it is where the world's going. At Google at the same time has made information easy to come by. Absolutely. Um, it hasn't made, um, interactions, it hasn't made face-to-face, -face. it made, actually a lot of this stuff has made that stuff harder. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. and, and so, you know, thinking about how do we, you know, this is all this talk about preparing kids, you know, college and career ready, you know, that we're, you know, how, how much in this conversation are people thinking about the fact that we really are preparing kids Getting the information now is the easy part. Mm. It's preparing them to, to be creative and productive in those kinds of environments and adapting to, a, to new ways of working and new ways of thinking about work and new ways of belt collaborating and being productive. And, you know, when you look at the school model that we've inherited from really the 19th century, mm. you know, I, I guess I have to ask myself if kids don't look at that and wonder, <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what are they preparing us for? Yeah. So, you know, I think that the energy that you bring and the kind of vision, you know, now the, I guess the question is, how do, you, how, do you, how do you, in that middle school, get from where we are to, to finding pieces of that vision that you can actually realize? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, something I do want to get to is what about, you know, Forest Park Middle School or Duggan Middle School or the middle school in the Bronx? Mm -hmm. um, and, and are the things that we're talking about in the big public conversation about standards, are those the tools that we need to make that accessibility more equitable? Or do we need to be thinking about other things? Mm -hmm. And if so, what are those things? Because you're a man with insight into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. Getting, finding a way to look at the world as it is and say, is our middle school preparing students for the way of the world as it is? Um, and sometimes you don't feel that it is, you know, um, and that's not a Birchland thing, that's an anywhere thing, just like you said, the, the educational model. Um, I am a believer that Common Core is, is, is headed in the right direction. Um, it, you know, Common Core is not a list of things students need to know. It's not a list of facts. The Common Core standards are a list of skills and a list of abilities um, that, that students need to be able to perform, especially um, it, as, as, as far as how they interact with the text and as well as how they interact with mathematics and science. Um, so, I, you know, I think we are in the right direction. Um, in that regard. But yeah, sometimes in education you feel like you're too far behind. You're, you're reacting 
to two phases ago instead of reacting to this phase. Um, there's a fantastic book called Creating Innovators, um, written by Tony Wagner from Harvard. Um, and myself and Michael Fredette, the principal of Maple Shade, are reading it right now and sort of discussing how it re relates to our different uh, schools and our different students. Um, but, but that says exactly what you're saying, which is the, the, the economy now is innovative and that's what we need to be doing. The information's there. How do we prepare students to come up with the next great innovation? So at the middle school level, I mean, certainly there's, there's still a lot of things students need to learn. And, and it, everything we needed to know hasn't gone away. I right. mean, we still right. need students to understand the concept of fractions. We still need students to understand how to read a text and pull out the main idea and make a persuasive argument from that. Um, so there are still there are still these constructs that we need to teach, but within the within each class that you teach, it's about giving students opportunities to develop these other skills at the same time. So if we're going to do a really hard math problem with our math class. Um, when I was in school, you know, the teacher probably would have described how to do a step and then had me do the step and then described the next step and had me do the next step or had the class, you know. Um, and and that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to, uh, education as, in general is trying to get away from. It's, you know, the world is such now that, hey, students, we're going to give you this hard math problem. We're going to give you two or three students to work with. And you've got to start to grapple with this. Right. You've got you to right. go down a wrong path just like they might at Google with an idea. And then you got to come back and then you got to try another path. Um, so there's a lot of teaching strategies that you can do um, overall, but also just minute to minute that gets students thinking and, and thinking creatively and problem solving. Um, and a lot of it is about, you know, when you talk about the school model, like you touched upon being from the 19th century, um, you know, I still agree with a lot of components of the school model, um, like most do, but, but there, is, there, 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 do, there does need to be a lot of time where, you know, the, the students become the center and the teacher becomes more of a facilitator. Um, you know, there's math classrooms now where, um, in, in America, where the entire wall is surrounded, it's just whiteboard. And literally, when I walk in as a student, I go to my whiteboard and I start to do, you know, the teacher might give a five minute lesson, but then I start to do my own problems. Mm -hmm. And when I finish my problems, the teacher comes and looks, yep, no, yep, this, that, the other, and then she's out. And now I'm right back to my next set of problems. And uh, so it's more like the teacher's bouncing around between everybody and the students are working at their pace, at their level. Um, and so it's a lot of different strategies like that. Um, and, and that's what we, you know, we're, we're doing. It was already being done at Birchland, and we're trying to continue, continue and, and, uh, and just make sure the students are going through those processes. That also, you know, in, in a sense recognizes, not in, it, it, it recognizes that, that kids are, um, that they're prepared to do that, that they're, they're prepared to go through that process. They, they may not necessarily be prepared to get the answer the first time. That's, that's the point. So there's a, there's a certain sense of empowerment, of, of, of a willingness to empower kids to, to take that risk. Um, how do you see that being extended into um, certainly the technology discussion? Because one of the things, and I, I think you probably saw at the, at the beginning of the year, the, the, the documentary that my kids did last semester about technology and you know all the d discussions about how do we implement technology in schools should we have one-to-one -one laptops and and I think when you talk to students about that you get some very interesting perspectives that that may be sort of surprising from the standpoint of of the educators um, how do you see kids involved in the larger conversation about their own learning in other words you set up a situation, a circumstance in the school where you're, you're creating a different kind of learning environment. You're structuring the whole approach to that differently. Um, how do you extend that to make those kids partners in the discussions about, is this working? I mean, beyond just assess, assessment, you know, is this working? Uh, you know, the next layer of problem solving about school itself. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something that's in people's thinking? Is it in your thinking? 
I think it's definitely something that's in people's thinking. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's a matter of how do you go about it. And at the middle school level, um, you know, one of our biggest goals is to teach students how to be students um, because they need to hit the high school as a student because they're going to be in a hundred different directions. Um, so, you know, the question is, what does it mean to be a student? Um, and sometimes the traditional response hasn't caught up to what it should mean. And, and, and uh, there's, you know, responsibility, on time, do my homework, listen to the teacher. That stuff's still all the same. But it also means now to be a student and then consequently to be a successful person in our new economy is um, a willingness to make mistakes and learn from them, um, a willingness to try something that seems too hard, um, a willingness to advocate for yourself, you know, um, and, uh, and an ability to think critically and think creatively. And those all sound sort of abstract, but that's our job in schools and our job, in my opinion, especially at the middle school, to start to help kids see that that's really how they should be. They should be thinking creatively. They should be advocating for themselves. They should be asking questions. You know, there's some specialists that say, we should be teaching a class that's just called asking questions. Um, because that's what's most important now. In, in, some of the, in some of the most innovative companies, it's, it's just about, can you ask the right question? You know, um, so um, in the middle school, th those are the kind of skills that you start to try and embed and help students see that. Now. Um, that can feel like this sometimes at any level, but s especially in the middle school where kids are starting to realize the, the social aspect of their lives and they're getting more and more involved in the sports and the drama and, and, and most, most especially they're getting more, more and more involved with their friends right. and you know, they're, right. they're trying to uh, jump out on their own. So sometimes education in the middle school feels like it's everything they don't want, um, but that's why we're here. That's why we get paid to keep... Um, to keep, to keep bringing that to them and try to package it in a way that says, this is what you want, this is what you need, this is what's good for you. And as far as getting their voice, um, you know, it's just about asking them, you know, and that, that happens in all honesty. Yeah, but that's been hard for people yeah. for a long time. Yeah, it has. And, but that happened, the more, it, 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 to me, it's an individual classroom thing, especially, but, you know, the more the teacher develops relationships with the students and, and the more the teacher encourages them to develop creativity and to develop um, the ability, like stick with it ability and all those things. Um, as the teacher does that more and more, then naturally the conversations are just going to arise where you start to get the student's voice. Um, and the students, you know, by becoming advocates for themselves, they also give the school feedback that is meaningful. Right. Um, so as we try to do all these things, once that student voice starts to come forth or come forward, I think that's when you realize we're getting it done. It's going well. Now let's listen to them and improve our practice. What are, so I'm just wondering if there are, if there are things that you identify maybe that, that you, because we, we, we focus a lot on preparation mm -hmm. and preparing kids really with this sort of underlying idea that they're not prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, the context of you know, look where we are, you know, relative to Singapore and we're two thirds of the way down and, um, you know, we need to do better to be competitive with the rest of the world and the, and the world, frankly, and I think one of the things that I'm, that I'm not sure kids have a, a vision of is the vision of their peers um, in places in every corner of the globe, those peers having access now through technology to the same information that you can get in a you know nice suburban school district in Massachusetts in the USA mm -hmm. um, and so the nature of that competitiveness has has really changed and is is going to confront them um, but are there things that the kids you find are really well prepared for that kind of surprise everybody or that that aren't really part of the conversation, but that, you know, you with your sort of vision of, of what the future is bringing, that they're really well positioned for, mm -hmm. um, that, does, that, that they don't get talked about, because I, I find it at the high school level. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first thing I would say in response to that question is, um, 
I've been in extremely um, delighted with our students' intrinsic motivation. So um, just, you know, even being in classrooms today, you just, you just walk from room to room, and in every room, like, so many of the students, you can just see it in their eyes, you can see in the fact that they're raising their hands, you can hear it in their smaller conversations. They want to learn the material that's in front of them. Uh, and I think that motivation to learn is probably, above anything we've talked about, the, the number, the step one, step one. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, um, so I, I can, you know, at Birchland, that is strong. Our, our kids are dedicated and they want to learn. Um, and and that's, a, that's a great place to start. Um, I, have, I have noticed at Birchland as well that a lot of our students, you know, they're, they're, they're improving from September to December to now January. Um, they are improving in how they advocate for themselves. There, there are more questions being asked. There, there is, you don't want to say pushback, but there's a little pushback. Like if they right. don't understand something the way it was explained, um, little by little you hear them sort of saying, we explain it a different way. You know, I, I can get it. I just need to see it differently. Um, so I think that motivation to learn and that, and, 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 it, and especially now figuring out how to stick with it and, and keep going till I learn, um, that's a good place to start. That's a good place to start. And, you know, you talked about the global economy and students um, not understanding sort of the, the world they're going into competitively. Um, and, and that's definitely the truth. And, and I don't know how we help them understand it. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know if we understand, understand it. it. Right, yeah. exactly. So, um, so uh, but I, I will say that, you know, high expectations helps, you know, um, Intrinsic motivation helps, and uh, I, I put a lot of stock in that, that testing and, and how we do versus the world, and certainly that the way the world has caught up to us and in some respects passed us now has changed everything in America as far as education. That's what started No Child Left Behind. That's what certainly has led to the Race to the Top program, Common Core, even the new teacher evaluations. It all comes from the fact that <laughs> the global economy has made it more essential that we speed up. Um, so it's, it's had a big impact. So that's going to take me back now to maybe a little bit more difficult part of the conversation. But, but again, your background and your experience in, in, in urban school districts, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you, you know, I'm thinking about poor countries that have traditionally not even really been in the thinking of, of the West or of the United States in terms of competitiveness, where technology is making it possible and there has been a commitment. I mean, the big story, you know, that you hear all the time is, is about the transformation in Finland from, you know, 25 years ago, essentially being at the bottom mm -hmm. to now being, you know, that's the, the sort of the poster child of, of education reform whether or not that's true, yeah. that there was a commitment there and a recognition and an application of, uh, you know, things that would, that would change that. Mm -hmm. um, are the things that we're talking about doing, making those kinds of transparent, we can see them, you can talk about them in Long Meadow, in East Long Meadow, places like Newton, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. statewide, are they having that kind of impact? And again, going back to the question of equity of access, are those same possibilities opening up in poor urban school districts in the United States? And if they, if they are, you know, is that, is that sufficient? Do you think that's gonna be the answer? Mm -hmm. If they're not, why not? And, and what's the impact of that? Because, again, to cite that statistic about college enrollment, I mean, you do definitely have a two-tiered college system where you've got white private colleges, mm -hmm. by and large, and most kids of color and low means in community colleges. And there's, no, there's nothing again. I mean, I had Ira Rubensall. I mean, he's the president of SDCC. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm a great advocate, and he's a great advocate for community colleges, as maybe that's part of the answer. Um, but it doesn't bode well for the future 
if the system that we're creating still provides disparity of access mm -hmm. and opportunity. You've been on both sides of it now. What do you, how do you see that? Yeah, well, that's been the most, you know, um, I've been so uh, engaged in the Birchland experience that that's not how I think when I'm there. But there are times, uh, and I talk to old colleagues, and I start to, s to see the differences between where I've been and where I am. Um, you know, in some respects, it's exactly the same, in a lot of respects. And, and you know, school is school. Young adolescents are young adolescents. Um, and so I think I've been sort of surprised by the similarities, but I've also been surprised by the differences. Um, and you touched on it a bit. And it, it, um, for me, it hasn't been... Um, it hasn't, it's turned out to not as been... I wouldn't define it as much as urban and suburban as much as just poverty and, and non-poverty. Because, um, you know, uh, I mean, I have two daughters that go to Springfield Public Schools and they're thriving and doing great. Right. And, um, and so, but they're not going to school every morning with what poverty brings. Correct. You know, and so um, th that's, that's been the biggest difference um, is just when a student comes to school 180 times a year coming from a poverty situation, it just brings with it such a social, emotional, and physical response that you have to deal with on a daily basis um, that sometimes um, those schools, they spend so much time just trying to get through that, the social, emotional, and physical, that they, it's hard to get to the academic. Um, and and, and uh, whereas if, if a student comes in with all that other stuff in place, you can there's still going to be ups and downs, but you can go right to the academic almost all the time. Um, so, you know, when I think back to my experience, um, just the school I was principal of, South End Middle School, and, um, and then assistant principal in a couple different places, we provided a lot of wonderful things in those schools. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, some, there's a high level of teaching practice in a, lot, uh, in a lot of the schools I worked in. There's a lot of instructional strategies and, and high expectations and a, and a dedication to the educational reform that comes along. Um, but again, it, a lot of it just gets lost in dealing with the poverty. Um, and, and therefore, the, you know, sometimes I found that a school was extremely high functioning. It was taking students from very hard places and... and um, and, and giving them a safe place every day where they could learn from teachers that cared and knew what they were doing. But once a year you took MCAS and just MCAS didn't necessarily reflect that. Right. Um, right. So um, I do think urban schools and, 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 and in, in our, where we live, the Springfield schools, I do think they are going in the right direction. I don't think, um, I don't think it should be we educate one way over here, we educate another way over here. I do think there should always be an acknowledgement of the differences in what we're dealing with poverty-wise. Um, and, you know, I, I, I certainly will always acknowledge that. I came from a school that was 98% free lunch. Um, we, you know, um, so, so I think that needs to be part of the conversation. Um, and the state is, is starting to see that. The, the, newest, um, the newest data that the state looks at is called PPI. And it's the first time where the state has devised an overall school score that it's not school A versus school B. It's um, school A versus school A. You know, it's uh, us versus ourselves. Right. And then it's school B versus school B. Um, and uh, and it, so it's all about getting better than where you were. Um, and, and that's how we get ranked now um, in, statewide. So I think there is a trend towards acknowledging that. Um, but that all said, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think the urban or poverty education problem has been solved, but I do think it's going in the right direction. Um, and I do think that the Common Core standards, that really working on student engagement, um, on the, the, certainly there's been a trend towards collaborative learning in every school that, I've, that I know of. Um, I think all of that bodes well for the urban students who, um, who, don't necessarily come with the same day-to-day uh, -day intrinsic motivation that I just bragged about Talked at about Birchland. Right. Um, but, you know, they still, they still do want to learn and they want to get through all the other stuff they have to deal with and still make a better life for themselves. So, themselves. so um, 
It doesn't answer it, but I, to me, I don't that's know if the there is an answer. Yeah, no, I, but an answer, I think it's yeah. you know the insight is it it's 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 genuine. I, I mean, I think that you know you've been there, you've you've experienced it, and and it's it's been obviously something that has affected communities and and education for a couple of generations. So, yeah. um, the, so you've expressed you know, your feeling about the, about the Common Core standards and, and clarified, I think, that, you know, we're, we're really not talking about a, a curriculum, a list of things that everybody has to know. Um, the other side of that, and I think what's getting a lot of criticism from the educators who are having mm -hmm. a problem with it is, is the testing side of it mm -hmm. and the assessment. Um, just, I don't want to belabor the, the Common Core discussion, but just some, some thoughts about about the park testing and um, you know assessment in general. I mean, certainly we've got the star assessments. The, the whole assessment paradigm has changed. Certainly from when I was a kid. Yeah. I guess from when you're a kid. Is is that? I mean, is that consistent with your thoughts about the process that that, that you've got to have that to can't have one without the other? Or? Yeah. Well, I certainly believe that student learning data is important, and I I do believe that. Uh, you know, a summative test at the end of the year, like an MCAS um, um, or a PARC. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's important just to keep, just to keep focus and keep everybody um, with a goal. And, and, but, but what's more important is check-ins along the way. And check-ins along the way don't need to be two or three day exams, but they are pieces of data that we get because, um, you know, as a teacher, I kept one quote on my desk. It said, it's not about what I get out every day, it's about what they get in. And, you know, I'm always encouraging our teachers to make sure, make sure, you know, I know you got through what you wanted to get through, but did they get it? You know, because if they didn't get it, then tomorrow we should do the same exact thing a different way because we can't move on if they didn't understand it. Um, my thing with the testing is there's too much of it. I, you know, I think testing could be... Um, I think, I, I forget the exact statistic, but I think America now spends over $4 billion a year in public school K-12 to testing. Um, and if you just simply did it, you know, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade, as far as the end of the year exam, the big one, um, you'd save almost $2 billion that could go into books, that could go into technology. You know, we're, we're, um, the, the, the modern classroom is still decades behind on what it should be technology wise um, so I, I think a level of accountability is certainly important I think I think that's not just education going there I think that's even the business world every, every world's going there um, there's there's now even uh, um, being piloted right now uh, an MCAS type test for colleges because a lot of employers are saying Students graduate and they tell us their GPA, but we don't even know what it means because it's so different at this school versus this school. So there's about a hundred colleges, if I'm not mistaken, taking a standardized test wow. senior year this year for the first time. Um, and, and we both know where that'll go, right? I mean, that'll become just another part of the conversation and it'll be another step in life. That'll, you know, and uh, so. Like unpaid I, internships. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I do think that program. testing is important, <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think we probably overdo it, um, especially when it comes to the big statewide, the statewide tests. Um, and then at the classroom level, it's, to me, it's not as much about the test as what we do about the test. You know, we can test, 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 but if all it does is give a kid a label, then, it's, then, then we shouldn't have done any of it. Um, but if we give a test and then we look at what didn't they master and how am I going to reteach it a different way, you know, then, then that was a really valuable experience for both the student and the teacher. Um, so. And how, so just, I mean, you've been in a number of different school systems, so let's leave it at that level. Yeah. How, how, how quickly are school districts adapting to that? understanding of mm -hmm. the value of these assessments? Yeah. Um, I think school districts uh, are, I, I would say they are adapting, and they are, especially now that 
you know, for years it was kind of just about that MCAS. And now that MCAS is still there, but we all kind of understand how to implement that, how to get ready for it as best we can. So the focus now has been on the checkpoints along the way, and many districts are doing that in many different ways. Um, and, you know, in Springfield we had a company we, that we paid, and they, we, our kids took their tests three or four times leading up to MCAS, and you'd go online and you'd get millions of pieces of data. You knew exactly what you needed to reteach. I mean, it was 48-hour turnarounds. Um, and that was partly because, you know, the pressure was on because the MCAS scores were low, so you, you kind of react faster. Um, so we don't have, um, we don't necessarily in East, at Birchland ask for another company to come in and give us these types of exams. Um, but we are working on it ourselves. And, um, you know, I, so I would say overall districts and education are buying into the need to look at student data and then reteach some things based on it. Um, but in my opinion, it's not about the district, it's, it's about how the building inspires each teacher to do that. So, um, it, and, and that is a whole different thing, you know. Um, it well, can so be, then I'll ask you, yeah. how's it working at the building level? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> uh, we're in our first cycle, and so um, teachers are, you know, we're, we're focused on um, open response writing, um, Common Core across all content areas, so every content area is, is doing open response writing, and teachers, the teachers came up with a rubric, an analytical rubric that looks at three components of the writing. Um, and the students are getting scored on all three and they're practicing with the rubric. Um, and our first cycle will be in January where we look at how they did and then mm -hmm. we figure out what to do next. Um, but I would say the teachers thus far are, are really involved in it and um, I'm happy to say helped, helped develop the rubric along the way. And, um, and I'm excited to watch them look at this data and sort of see, okay, this is what I want them to get better at, so now let me plan on how to do that. But that's a very individual um, process. Um, every teacher will go through it internally and externally a little bit differently. Um, but I know a Birchin, you know, and, and, and like most schools, we'll be right there to support them as a leadership team. And, and we hope that uh, even someone that's a little scared by it or a little put off by it, you know, we, we hope that as they see students improving in these areas, you know, improvement is addictive. So um, if, if, if this has the impact, we hope it will, that can give it momentum uh, on its own. Uh, so, but that all said, I've worked with teachers at four different schools on this process, and it's right. really interesting. It's really <laughs> interesting. And uh, it can be... Um, it can be it can be scary for teachers, you know, and I get it. Um, you know, it, it's it's scary for me because I'm judged on how all of them do. So, um, so so it's an interesting process. Um, it's certainly one where, you know, you hope that you have the relationships in place where you can have conversations with them and and sort of support them through it. And uh, well, and that takes you back to the to the relational, you know, centerpiece of of really what you're doing, yeah. um, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so, any any particular challenges that you that you want to talk about? So I'll give you the choice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like like the the biggest challenge or the biggest surprise yeah. that you've encountered in the in the in the first half of a school year. Yeah, the biggest challenge for me has just been um, it's a much bigger school than the the first school I was principal of. It's over twice the size. Um, and, and it is a different environment. And so the biggest challenge for me personally has just been learning to navigate all the different things, all the different committees, all the different um, structures that are in place. Um, you know, as a leader, you hate those moments where you're trying to help somebody with a problem and they understand the problem better than you do, you know. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time, as has my assistant principal, we're trying to understand the problems so that we can then be hopefully support systems rather than, you know, well, how would you fix it? You know, right. I, I feel like I say that way too often, <laughs> but what would you do? Uh, so, um, so just sort of wrapping my head around um, the new school, the new staff, the new students, the new community. Um, but I would also say that that, you know, it's been the biggest challenge and it's been the biggest surprise as well. Um, you know, um, like I said, the staff has, I ju just, I remember our first meeting, the first day I was there and I, 80 of us were in a room and, you know, we, we, we spent an hour, me sort of introducing myself and just sort of saying who I am, what I'm about and how I'm here to support you, hopefully. And, and uh, 
I just, I just have loved every minute because it's, um, it's, it's been a, it's, to me with the students and the staff, it feels like the school is really a family, um, and it's a family that's strengthening as we go because. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about my experience, but if you talk to anybody that works there, they've had two new administrators in the right. same year. That is a big, big deal. Um, and so um, I think I've been uh, happily surprised by just how open and how uh, trusting the, the environment is. Um, I, and I think it's happened pretty quickly. And that doesn't mean there's not room to grow in that area, but, um, but that's been really nice. That's great. Um, so you were in middle school however many years ago and without really thinking about thinking back you know for some specific thing you could probably identify or probably are aware of a handful of things that you have carried with you like really in your front pocket since then about that experience what are the things that you want your kids 25 years from now to have in their front pocket from the time they're spending in your building? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost would just be those teachers that you remember. Um, I can still remember my seventh and eighth grade math teacher and science teacher and English teacher, and, and they made a huge impact on me, um, both by holding me to a high uh, expectation, but also by supporting me and and being sort of a partner in the process and not you know someone that I couldn't relate to. So um, I'm hoping that the students at Birchland and I think they are feeling that connection to their teachers because li like we've said in middle school that connection learning doesn't happen for the most part if that connection doesn't exist. Um, uh, the other thing for students is you just hope that they'll feel comfortable in their own skin and feel good about who they are. Um, that's hard, and that's harder in today's world than it was in mine. Um, I went to a uh, very diverse middle school, large middle school. Um, I was very short. <laughs> I was, you know, uh, uh, and I played basketball. And I just remember that those years were the years where I sort of developed who I was going to be um, and what my, what my interests were going to be. And, and, you know, I was sort of all over the place. And then you start to see when you get to seventh and eighth grade especially, this is who I am. And you want kids, when they decide this is who I am, to feel good about who they are. Um, and it's harder now with all the social media and all these different pressures that we didn't have um, coming up. But at the core, it's still, you know, developing a sense of self. So I really hope the students at Birchland are, you know, happy with who they are, proud of who they are, enjoying their relationships with their teachers, uh, and just sort of looking forward to the next day. Sounds terrific. Tim, thanks so much for coming yeah, by. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. I'd love to have you back and I appreciate continue it this conversation. Thank you. All right, that'll do it for this episode. We'll see you next time.